Good evening. Welcome to the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is our Wednesday evening Bible study. It is 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, USA. Here in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina, we've had a wonderful sunny day. Hope your day has been wonderful where you are. And we're so excited and blessed for your presence. We are going through the Bible, and we are looking at all the books of the Bible and introducing them and surveying them in an introductory fashion. And tonight, we are excited to bring to you the book of John. The book of John is the fourth gospel, and it is the most unique of all the Gospels for a whole host of reasons that we will uh, soon describe. So if you will turn in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 1. There is no more of a crescendo of an opening for any book in the Bible, it seems more grand than the book of John. And I'd like to share that with you right now, and then we'll have an opening prayer. You can almost hear the cosmic angelic chorus singing as the words come to life, inspired by the Holy Spirit and written down on parchment by the Apostle John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us to life, each and every one of us. We're thankful, Lord, that you have given us this day our daily bread and that you have given us this day a measure of health and you've given to us this day a measure of safety. We are grateful and thankful, Father, for every blessing from your hand. We are thankful, Lord, for the word of God it comes to us 66 times, and we're thankful, Lord, for John, the friend of Christ, the apostle of love, who brought us this gospel that brings to us the emotions and the relationships and the feelings and friendships of Christ and those who knew him most intimately. We're thankful, Lord, that we too can know Christ in this way by reading this gospel and living out the precepts that John shares with us. Precepts that will prepare us for an eternity with Christ and with all those who have been found faithful throughout all time, including John the Apostle, who all believers of all time will one day meet in heaven itself as we surround the throne of God. 
We thank you, Lord, for this book. And may it instill in us a deep desire to know Jesus more each day. We pray, Lord, for those that we know and those that we don't regarding this terrible virus and for other ill health issues that so many have. We pray, Lord, your most kind blessings upon them all, should it be your will. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those who are in harm's way from storms and the aftermath of storms. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us all with a desire to go to heaven at the end of our days, no matter what. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're talking about the book of John. The book of John. The gospel of John. And... We'll just, just make a few observations and look at some text. Uh, John the Apostle, from all we can understand uh, from history and archaeology and those who knew him wrote of him later, uh, he most likely wrote this gospel somewhere around the year 86. And it is primarily, more so than the other three Gospels, evangelical and apologetic. It is a book. Hey, Effie, good evening to you. It is a book that strives to convince the readers and the hearers to follow Jesus Christ, a man known more intimately on earth here, more than any other. This man, John, was the best friend in the flesh that Christ had. And it was John who was the only apostle who was at the foot of the cross as Christ gave his life and shed his blood for all mankind. And it was from that cross that Jesus gave John the distinct and unique honor and responsibility of the care of his mother as he died. No other had the care of his mother other than John. Even the brothers of Christ were not given this honor and this distinction. Their mother was cared for by someone outside of the blood family of Christ, but the one who was closest to him as a friend in this life. John has the most precise thesis of any of the Gospels. If you'll uh, turn in your book of John to this chap to the twentieth chapter, the thesis statement of the entire book is rendered. And um, chapter uh, twenty and verse. 31. And it's part of a complete sentence that begins in verse 30. Here's why John wrote his gospel, which we'll describe as very unique from a lot of reasons. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is a very precise thesis statement. John is a wonderful book and it's targeted at the unbeliever who challenges the unbeliever to read and hear these words and then make a decision. Is Jesus the Christ or is he not? And John gives many evidences to the fact that he in fact is. Now, the book of John is divided up into essentially two areas. It's um, a detail of what Christ did, but it's also a book of apologetics. It is a book that strives to show the veracity or the truthfulness of what's being taught as real history and real truth. And uh, John delves into both these things. Um, now, we're going to ask and answer the question, who is John? It's very interesting about John. John turns out to be a man of extreme humility. In fact, in the Gospel of John, he never mentions his name. But on a number of occasions, he refers to himself, not by name, but by using this statement or this description. The one whom Christ loved. The one whom Christ loved. Describing himself without naming himself. And uh, if you want to write this down, uh, he does this five times. Five times. Uh, 13 verse 23, chapter 19 verse 26, chapter 20 verse 2, uh, chapter 21 verse 7, and finally chapter 21 verse 20. The disciple whom Christ loved is his description. But John, as we uh, stated, is primarily uh, a book of evangelism and apologetics. But there's some characteristics that I'd like to share with you that make John unique as compared to the other three Gospels which we refer to <coughs> excuse me, as synoptics. Uh, they are, are synchronized. They're event-driven uh, from different perspectives. Matthew, as we have looked at, Matthew was written from the perspective of a Jew. Mark was written from the perspective of the Roman. And Luke was bitten, written from the perspective of the Greek or the Gentile. But John is a book about uh, things other than facts and history and doctrine. Uh, those things are necessary and wonderful, but there's another side of Jesus Christ that John wanted to share, that he felt from his perspective he knew about, and he wanted other people to know about it, because a lot of people want to understand other sides of facts and records and events and chronology. So John is four things uh, that are unique to him. His his gospel. First of all, his gospel is very personal. He's there, and he is one of the three uh, disciples that Christ spent spends more time with than the others. Uh, those, of course, are James 
and John, sons of Zebedee, James being the older, John being the younger, and Peter. Peter, James, and John are the three companions of Christ. But John was closest to Christ. And it was John's personal love for Christ that drove him to the foot of the cross on that day of sorrow and rejoicing. Um, and he was there with Mary, the mother of Christ. And it's this where Christ declared him the keeper of his mother. So John is a very personal book, number one. Number two, it is more than the other Gospels, uh, more emotional. It sh shows the emotions of the participants described in this book, especially Jesus and others. The personal aspect number one and the emotional aspect number two and number three of all the gospels it's the most empath uh, empathetic it it understands people's sorrow it understands people's difficulties it understands people's issues that they struggle with in this life John is a very empathetic person, and of course Christ is the most empathetic of all because he is our creator and our savior and our redeemer and our sustainer. And finally, uh, John is more than the other gospels, more relational. It deals with the relationships of people one with another far more than the other Gospels. And so John is a wonderful book because it plugs us in to things that we may not see quite apparently in the other Gospels. Not to say that the other Gospels are not personal, emotional, empathetic, or relational, but John is more so. And these things come to the surface in John far more than they do in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So who is this person, John? Uh, as we mentioned, he is the younger of two brothers, James being the older, John being the younger, sons of Zebedee, who was a fisherman. He had a fishing business. And James and John were the two major employees, if you please, of this business. They were the sons of their father, and it was their family business to fish. So they were the sons of Zebedee, according to uh, uh, Matthew 10, verses 2 and 4. But also, uh, James and John in their youth were fiery individuals. In fact, uh, Jesus in Mark chapter 3 and verse 17 nicknames them as the sons of thunder. These guys were always wanting to call down lightning and strike the enemy. And uh, Jesus gives them this nickname, the Sons of Thunder, John and James, James and John. Uh, now, James and John at one time also asked if uh, they could sit through their mother. They didn't ask by themselves, they asked through their mother that they might be honored with sitting on the right and left hand of Christ when he came into his kingdom. He, they thought he would come into a physical kingdom that would defeat the Romans, uh, sort of like the Maccabees did against the Greeks, and they were really chomping at the bit for that sort of thing. And uh, Jesus says, are you, are you ready to uh, 
uh, be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized. He's speaking metaphorically, and James and John say, "Yeah, yeah, we're we're ready to sign up. Sign us up and set us on the right hand and the left hand of of your throne when you take the throne of Israel." Um, so these were the sons of uh, thunder. Uh, but John later became something other than a thrower of lightning bolts. If you'll turn with me over to Galatians chapter 2, we see uh, that John becomes something else later. Paul writes about him. Galatians 2, uh, we'll start at the sentence, Paul, Paul is notorious for writing long sentences, um, verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through mine uh, to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars perceived the grace that was given to me they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised so it's interesting Paul says that uh, three men seem to be pillars in the Jerusalem church and those three are James who uh, is not the brother of of John. This James referring to is the brother in the flesh of Christ. Uh, because James, the brother of John, is very early on uh, beheaded by Herod, executed for the way. And this James is speaking of James, the half brother of Christ. And Cephas, of course, is Peter. And the third pillar is John. John, the former son of thunder, is now a pillar in the church by the time Paul comes around, some 24 years later. Okay. Uh, John is also a compatriot of Peter. They partnered quite often early on. Uh, Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John go to the temple and find the, the, the man lame from birth at the gates of the temple and he's healed. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 8 we also see Peter and John working together in the early church uh, as they, in the first ten years, work to build the church among the Jews. Uh, now, this author is unique in another, in, a, in several other ways. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, John didn't write just this gospel. He also wrote. Uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. And uh, the irony, if you can use that word, I don't know if it's a proper word or not, but uh, 1 John is typically considered uh, the least um, complicated uh, book in the New Testament when it comes to the Greek language construct. And in most Greek uh, textbooks where Greek is taught in the first 
year. Uh, almost everyone will use as a text the book of 1 John because it's of its simplistic and basic use of the Greek language. Um, but having said that, John is also the same one, the author of the book of Revelation, which goes into extraordinary flowerful language, symbolic language, apocryphal language, and this comes from the pen of the same man. He was really amazing, John was. Now, he wrote this book to no specific audience, but yet he wrote it to every audience. So we might call John's gospel the every man's gospel. Matthew is the Jewish gospel. Mark is the Roman gospel. Luke is the Greek gospel. But John's gospel, being so personal, so emotional, so empathetic, and so relational, it's every man's gospel, every woman's gospel, every person's gospel. It relates to our emotions, our feelings, our empathies, and our relationships. And it brings to us, especially, the very, very, very close friendship of Jesus Christ and this man that we call John. Now, I want us to uh, mention just uh, several things now about the book itself, how it's laid out. Uh, in uh, the first part of the book, uh, in the uh, what we might call the um, evangelistic part of the book where he's detailing uh, all these events surrounded by all these emotions and feelings and relationships uh, seven signs that Jesus is indeed the Christ uh, and then there's another sign, an eighth sign that's at the very end of the book which is the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. But the first uh, section on surrounding uh, the signs, the seven signs, of course seven is the number in the Hebrew uh, mindset that speaks to uh, perfection and to God. Uh, seven is perfection. Six is imperfection, standing for man. And seven is perfection, standing for God. So these seven signs in the book of John. Uh, number one, uh, when John, uh, Jesus goes to Cana and turns the water into wine. Number two, uh, the healing of the centurion's son. Uh, number three, the healing of the lame man. Number four, the feeding of the multitude. Uh, number five, perhaps the most powerful, uh, uh, other than uh, the seventh one, is when Jesus walks on water. Then he heals the blind man. And finally, number seven, the raising of Lazarus. This one particular thing that Jesus did is the most powerful sign that he ever gave. On one occasion, the Jews said, uh, well, well, we want to see a sign. And Jesus says, well, uh, no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah as Jonah 
was in the fish, the belly of the fish, for three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be in the earth three days and three nights. And we know that Jonah came out of the fish, and we know that Jesus came out of the grave. But this uh, raising of Lazarus was extremely powerful. First of all, all Israel was there to witness it. Uh, the leaders of the Jews were there. The scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they were all there. They all saw it. That Now the Jews believed that a soul departed from the body after three days. So Jesus purposely delays his coming until the fourth day. So nobody could ever say that he was just asleep. Uh, they all knew that he was really dead because it was the fourth day. Uh, the tomb was sealed. Um, and uh, he had been wrapped uh, to the point where when Jesus called him out uh, that they were so stunned they couldn't do anything. He had to order them to unwrap him. Uh, this was a sign that no one could deny. But not everybody believed. There's a whole lot of difference between not denying uh, not acknowledging something and um, not believing it. Uh, everybody acknowledged it, but not everybody believed it. Uh, so those are the seven signs that that John uh, uses. Uh, but he also, uh, in an apologetic way, uh, goes and uh, shows that uh, there are seven assertion, assertions of his divinity that we call the I Ams. Now, uh, I Am is in the Greek language the same construct as Jehovah in the Old Testament. It's the personal name for God. And Jesus refers to himself as I am seven times and each time he makes this assertion he essentially says I am God and I have power over certain things and you need to believe me believe in me you need to repent of your sins and follow me because I am he, paraphrasing what Christ would say. So the first uh, uh, I am statement, he essentially says, I am the bread of life, which means that Jesus is the sustainer of life. Uh, this is why we offer thanks at table because whether we realize it or not every morsel of food that enters our bodies comes from Jesus Christ because he is the sustainer of life he's the provider of good things he sustains us all he is the bread of life. And second of all, he says, I am the light of the world. Uh, it is always appropriate to be understanding of what light is. We believe that light has to come from a primary source. Uh, you can see in the background here, I have a lamp on uh, to my left. Now, how did that light come on? Well, it's hooked up to an electricity power, and there's a light bulb in there. And when I turn on the switch, light pours forth out of the lamp. But uh, light, ultimately, we think that light ultimately comes from the sun. Where, where do we get light during the day? It's 
from the sun. Where do we get light at night? Well, it comes primarily from the moon, which is reflection of the sun on the other side of the world at the nighttime when we're in the nighttime. But actually, if you go back to the book of Genesis, Jesus Christ creates light before he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. You think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ is not only the creator of light, he is, in essence, light itself. The power to create life is in him. He is the light of the world. Uh, he then talks about being the door of the sheep. And for us, this is the most important thing that we can contemplate and consider. He says, I am the door to the sheep. In order to go into the fold of God, one must enter into the singular door. And, of course, this is a metaphor, but Paul tells us about this uh, in Galatians chapter 3. And I'd like you to turn just for a moment over to Galatians 3 uh, because, my friends, uh, the most important thing that any of us will ever consider is am I or am I not in Christ? Uh, have I entered into the door of Christ? Have I entered into his fold? Am I in Christ or am I out of Christ? And Galatians 3, verse 23, beginning. Let's read. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For, listen here, in Christ... For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How do you enter into the fold? You enter into it by entering into Christ. How does one enter into Christ? Well, the answer is uh, exclusive and singular. The only way to get into Christ is to be baptized into him. As Peter said on Pentecost, he called on all of them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be added to the church by the Lord himself. That's how one gets into Christ. That's how one gets into the fold through the door. And the door is Christ. Uh, the fifth I am statement uh, that he speaks to Martha about. Um, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus not only was raised from the dead, he is resurrection and he is life. Jesus is the key to eternal life. In essence, he is life and resurrection, and resurrection and life are him. They're synonymous, they're one and the same. So not only do we have to enter into the gate through him, he is more than just a door. He epitomizes resurrection and he epitomizes life itself. And then, of course, the one that we readily recognize so easily. I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. This is the most exclusive statement ever made in the history of all eternity. Jesus proclaims that he and only he is the way singular, the truth singular, the life singular, who comes to the Father singular through him singular. The way is very, very distinctly named, but it's very narrow in that there are no other entities through which one can be saved. There is no resurrection in any other name. There is no life in any other name. There is no way in any other name, and so forth. In fact, uh, this was such an important statement in the early church that for some time uh, before the uh, 10 years or so were up, uh, the church was referred to as the way. This is uh, how they were described and how they described themselves, the way. And finally, Jesus says, I am uh, the true vine. Uh, we're either attached to Christ or we're cut off from Christ. Uh, again, exclusiveness, singularity is all noted here. And all these seven signs and all these eight statements of proof, assertions of divinity, are all brought to us by this man John uh, as he speaks to these matters very very personally very very emotionally very very much by way of empathizing with us he always is talking about relationships relationships with each other and primarily relationships with God and so this is the book of John and never forget that John wants more than anything for his readers and hearers to believe the things that are asserted in this book and he does so very close to the vest gets real real close he gets real real personal he gets in our space as it were uh, he makes us uncomfortable at times but at the end of the day we understand that this Jesus whom he knows intimately is the ultimate friend in the form of God himself who is seeking us he is seeking us as who else other than John John in John chapter 4 Jesus tells the woman at the well that God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth that one statement of Christ to that woman tells us in a very succinct way that God is personal God is emotional God is empathetic towards our situation he wants a relationship with us our time has ended and thank you so much for being here tonight with the Archdale Church of Christ. Hey, Lois and Tony, glad you're here. And so we'll see you next time here with the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. Good night and God bless you.